Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, today is a uh, he Women's Healthy Weight Day, which is a perfect time to remember that uh, you're not a size zero if people can see you healthy tip. Uh, very appropriately for the talk tonight, it is Celebration of Life Month. Uh, it is also National Hot Tea Month, uh, a reminder of a time when my grandmother thought that anything could be cured with a spot of tea. Um, I think tonight's guest would beg to differ with that. And so I now officially welcome you one and all to Skeptical Inquirer Presents. This, as you know, is a series of live online presentations from experts who are devoted to advancing science over pseudoscience, media literacy over conspiracy theories, and of course, critical thinking over magical thinking. My name is Leanne Lord, and I am delighted to be your host. Uh, I am a stand-up comedian and author, and my official internet residence is VeryFunnyLady.com, but I summer on Instagram and I winter on Twitter. You can see me in action on Even More Funny Women, of a certain age, uh, which is streaming right now on Showtime. And my dry bar comedy special has had over 1 million views. I'm so excited. Um, now, I know you know this, but uh, I'd like to remind you of two things. Uh, one, CFI's podcast, Point of Inquiry, is available wherever you get your podcasts. And two, Skeptical Inquirer magazine, uh, which has a print and a digital subscription option, is available at skepticalinquirer.org. And let's see, tonight's guest, this is very exciting, is uh, Skeptical Inquirer Presents returning champion. Uh, this is his third visit with us, you guys, third. And, and when he's here, we really like to make sure that we leave extra time uh, for your questions. So by all means, uh, please drop those into the Q&A box and we'll get to as many um, as we can because we are leaving a, a good amount of space for that because you guys always ask a lot of questions when he's here. And um, this time he is here to talk about his new book, very exciting, uh, You Bet Your Life, uh, from blood transfusions to mass vaccination, uh, the long and risky history of medical innovation. And I, I have to say this book really got me thinking because I was born into a world where measles, smallpox, and polio were not a thing. You know, when something was wrong with you, doctors just fixed it. And I, I know this because I was a, I was a sickly kid. Uh, when I was two years old, I had eye surgery. Uh, when I was three, I started wearing glasses. Uh, I also wore braces and corrective shoes, very sexy. Uh, I had an asthma attack that nearly killed me, um, but the folks at the hospital sort of waved their magic stethoscopes because when, when, magic, uh, when medicine works, uh, it seems like magic, and when it doesn't, uh, it seems diabolical. Now, I, I wasn't the first kid to have these medical interventions, but I never thought about the ones who were you know, until I was an adult and an adult that um, in any other time might not have survived to be. And I know I'm not the only one uh, by far, um, but how did we get here? You know, and what does that cost, right? And our guest is going to talk about that. Uh, he is a professor of pediatrics at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Uh, he is the author of several books, including uh, some of my favorites, uh, Do You Believe in Magic? Uh, the Sense and Nonsense of Alternative Medicine, Bad Advice, or Why Celebrities, Politicians, and Activists Aren't the Best Source of Health Information, and Overkill, uh, When Modern Medicine Goes Too Far. Uh, and of course, it always tickles me when I see him pop up on my, on my TV screen uh, as a frequent guest on CNN. And uh, we were talking about this off camera. We both now share uh, a love of the TV show, Ted Lasso. He's the one who got me hooked on it. And I'm very grateful and I love it. And he's given me some more TV recommendations. Uh, but without further ado, uh, please welcome Dr. Paul Offit. Hey, Dr. Paul, thank you for being here. Thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to be here. So, so here's the way I think this is gonna work. I'll probably talk for maybe 15 or 20 minutes and then take your questions. So um, I am on the FDA's Vaccine Advisory Committee. 
And in December 2020, uh, we were asked to review data from Pfizer and from Moderna for their mRNA vaccines on December 10th and December 17th to answer the question, do we recommend approval of these vaccines through this emergency use authorization? Now, the, the size of those studies was interesting. Pfizer did a trial of about 40,000 people, one-to-one -one vaccine to placebo, so 20,000 people got Pfizer's vaccine. Moderna did a vaccine trial of 30,000 people, again, one-to-one -one vaccine to placebo, so 15,000 people got Moderna's vaccine. That meant that 35,000 people had received the mRNA vaccines. Now, when we made that recommendation, we knew that this was a vaccine that was going to be given ultimately to hundreds of millions of people. I mean, there have been roughly 3.5 billion people on this planet who have already been fully vaccinated with, with vaccines, with the COVID vaccines, and probably 9 billion doses that have been administered. So was that enough information? Did we know enough to, to say that now we could safely give this vaccine and effectively give this vaccine? And safety was actually what worried us the most. Um, and the reason is, is that I was in the middle of writing this book, uh, You Bet Your Life, knowing that there has never been a medical advance in history that has not come with a human price. You always learn as you go. There are always things you find out later that you would have never anticipated earlier. And that was true with these vaccines, not only the mRNA vaccines, but also Johnson and Johnson's vectored virus vaccine. There were surprises with both of those vaccines. And that's what sort of really sets you back when you're trying to think, should I move forward with this? And it gets more and more difficult as you move down to the 12 to 15 year old or the five to 11 year old, or we're soon gonna hear the less than five year old every time you're worried about it because you never know when you know enough. So let me just go through a few examples of that. One would be gene therapy. So this was a, a University of Pennsylvania story and that's where I am. So in 1999, Jesse Gelsinger was a 19 year old boy from Arizona who had an unusual enzyme deficiency, which made it such that he couldn't um, essentially rid his, his bloodstream of ammonia was it sort of a product of, of protein metabolism. And um, it was the fancy name for this was a tra an ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency. And so to provide him with the gene he needed, there was sort of a star of gene therapy research at the Wistar Institute named Jim Wilson. And what Wilson had done is he took adenovirus, which is sort of a common cold virus, and made it such that it couldn't reproduce itself, which is exactly the way that Johnson Johnson's vaccine is made, and exactly the way that AstraZeneca's vaccine is made. He then took that, that cold virus and, and, and inserted into it the gene that Jesse Gelsinger lacked, that ornithine transcarbamylase gene. And, and he did a series of studies. Guess Gelsinger was, 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 was one of the later sort of entrants into this study, where he then in, inoculated people intravenously or, or it eventually into the artery that supplied the liver um, with, with increasing doses of this replication defective adenovirus that contained the gene that he was missing. And he went slowly, carefully, with each in slight increase in dose, moving up and up and up. And there was a, a, a woman who, right before him, got the same dose he got. Nonetheless, when he got that vaccine, uh, got that vaccine rather, when he got that gene therapy, um, he, after a couple days, started to develop high fever. Then he, his, his, he developed severe pneumonia. His kidney shut down. He was put on dialysis. He was put on uh, ultimately on a ventilator, then a heart-lung machine, and over a period of a few days, he died. Now, Jim Wilson had done everything he could to sort of guarantee safety. He tested this, this product in, in mice. He tested it in non-human primates. He slowly tested it in one person after the next after the next. And nonetheless, Jesse, Jesse Gelsinger died. He was really the first of the gene therapy deaths, and that sent gene therapy back years because of that death. And Jim Wilson was roundly criticized for that, although I'm not sure what he could have done differently, frankly. Um, and so he set it upon, set upon himself the task of figuring out what had gone wrong. Why had Jesse Gelsinger died? And what he found was that, that Gelsinger had, in response to getting that adenovirus vector, he had gotten, had a, a massive response of an immunological protein, a cytokine called interleukin-6. Now, had he known about it at the time, had Wilson known that that was the problem, it wouldn't have mattered because there was nothing that was, was in the, the armamentarium in medicine to really counteract that. But nonetheless, that was an important finding because it ended up being a life-saving finding for those who followed. 
in this way. Um, we sort of fast forward a few years to a, to a girl who we took care of at the hospital I work at Children's Hospital Philadelphia, a little five-year-old girl named, named Emily Whitehead. She had acute lymphoblastic leukemia. She was given chemotherapy to which she became refractory. She was given a second round of, of more dangerous chemotherapies to which she also became refractory. So she was on her way out. I mean, this, this was, there was really nothing that they could do for her. And so there was a researcher at, uh, at uh, Penn named Carl June who had developed a type of therapy called CAR-T, where what you do is you take the, the, the so-called T cells from, from the patient, in this case, from Emily Whitehead, and the, the, the specific type of T cell you take is called cytotoxic T cell. Cytotoxic meaning kills other cells. So cytotoxic T cells kills other cells. He then engineered that, that cytotoxic T cell that he got from Emily Whitehead so that it would attack her leukemia cells. He injected it back into her, and within a couple of days, she developed the exact same symptoms that Jesse Gelsinger had developed. Now, there were two researchers at CHOP, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, that knew what had happened to Jesse Gelsinger. Um, one was named Steve Grupp, the other David Tichy. And so they, they thought, you know, let's see whether or not she has also this same high level of interleukin-6, which she did. And the good news was that they're at this point now, years later, there was a monoclonal antibody that was available, not for this purpose, actually for to sort of treat rheumatoid arthritis, that was available to, to treat her. And so they treated her and saved her life. And so Carl June became a hero. Uh, his CAR T therapy took off in, in mar large part because this was such a dramatic result. And, 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 and Emily Whitehead was celebrated. She visited the White House. There's pictures of her next to President Obama. She was on the Today Show. Um, she was on Dateline NBC. She, she, was, she was a hero and, 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 uh, and Carl June was a hero. And if you go to the, the CAR-T laboratory at the University of Pennsylvania, you see pictures of Emily Whitehead with President Obama. You see pictures of her on national television. What you don't see is you don't see a picture of Jesse Gelsinger, even though without Jesse Gelsinger, you would have never learned what it, what, what it was that was happening to Emily Whitehead. And that's invariably the story. We sort of celebrate our failures and never sort of recognize the, 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 the I'm sorry, we celebrate our victories, but never recognize the, the defeats that ultimately led to those victories. Um, okay, we'll go to, to the next story, biologics. So in, um, in 1904, there were 13 children with diphtheria who when they were treated with diphtheria anatoxin, which was made in horses, died of tetanus. So in other words, while getting a diphtheria-specific anisera, they died of tetanus because the anisera, the horse from whom that, that anisera was generated, in whom it was generated, actually was suffering from tetanus, unknown to the people who harvested the, the serum. And so, so um, that led to the first of what had been a series of, of acts by the, the uh, Food and Drug Administration, ultimately called the Biologics Control Act. Okay, so now you go to, to another story, which is the antibiotic story. And the, the first major antibiotic was an antibiotic called elixir sulfonilamide, or the, it was called sulfonilamide. It was a product of the German dye industry. It was invented in the mid 1930s. It was the first antibiotic that had broad spectrum activity that could treat pneumonia, that could treat gonococcal infections, that could treat meningitis, sulfonilamide. It was called the magic bullet. And so Many, many companies stepped forward to make it. Merck and others made it as a, as a powder, as a tablet. Um, and there was one company, um, the Massengill Company of Bristol, Tennessee, that wanted to make it palatable for children, to make it an oral medicine, a liquid, rather than a powder or a tablet. To do that, they suspended the, the sulfonilamide, which was not easily solubilized, in diethylene glycol. And they shipped out 240 gallons across the United States to be used in, to treat a variety of bacterial infections. That product killed 105 people, 34 of whom were children. The reason was is that diethylene glycol was toxic to kidneys. And so had all 240 gallons been consumed, 4,000 people would have died. This was a seminal event in the history of the Food and Drug Administration and led to the birth of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act. So, so invariably, as Michael Harris, who's an historian, says, 
correctly that the history um, of drug regulation in the United States is built on tombstones. I think one of the worst disasters involves vaccines. And it, it's amazing how few people actually know about this particular problem. Because again, when you think about the polio vaccine, all you can think about is the successes associated with the, that vaccine and not the tragedy, the central tragedy that I think was arguably the worst biologic disaster in this country's history. So what did Jonas Salk do? What he did was he took polio virus, he grew it up in monkey kidney cells, he then purified the virus, he killed it with the, the, uh, the chemical formaldehyde, and then he injected it into roughly 700 children in and around Pittsburgh. He found that the vaccine was safe. He found that it induced an, an excellent uh, neutralizing antibody response against the virus. And he went home to his wife, Donna, after he'd done all those studies and said, Eureka, I've got it. As far as Jonas Salk was concerned, that was enough. He didn't want to do anything more than that. He wanted now to mass produce this vaccine and get it out there. And this was actually um, all funded by the March of Dimes, which was a private philanthropic organization that paid for the research, ultimately paid for the, the, the mass, mass production, mass distribution, and mass administration of that vaccine, a private philanthropic organization. Um, but, Jonas, but, but nonetheless, the March of Dimes insisted on doing a clinical trial. They wanted to prove that the vaccine worked and that it was safe. And so what, what they did was they proceeded to do was the largest clinical trial of a medical product in history. 420,000 children were given Jonas Salk's polio vaccine, 200,000 were given placebo as a control over a one year period. And when it was over, Thomas Francis at the University of Michigan stood up at the podium at Rackham Hall at the University of Michigan and said those three famous words, safe, potent, and effective. And that was the headline on every major newspaper in this country. I mean, synagogues had, held special prayer meetings, church bells rang out, department stores stopped for that announcement to be made. I am a child of the 1950s. I remember my mother crying when that announcement was made. So how did he know it was effective? And this is also sort of part of what price are you willing to pay to, for knowledge? The, re, the way that, that Thomas Francis knew that that vaccine was effective was that 16 children died from polio in that study, all in the placebo group. He knew it was effective because 36 children were paralyzed in that study, 34 in the placebo group. That's why Jonas Salk didn't want to do that trial. He didn't want to give placebo to children in the summer in, in, in this country when you knew that polio could cause as many as 20 to 30,000 children to be paralyzed every year and cause 1,500 to die every year. But such was the price of knowledge. And frankly, just to sort of get back in a sense to, to our FDA vaccine advisory committee, when we did a study, when, when we looked at the study of 12 to 15 year olds, that was a 2,400 child study. And the, the, there were 18 cases and one to one vaccine to placebo. So basically 1200 children got vaccine, 1200 got placebo. There were 18 cases of COVID in that study, 18, all in the placebo group. And so when we then approved that vaccine, I got a lot of hate mail from people saying, really 2400 children, that's enough for you. Um, you had just done a trial with, in adults with Pfizer's vaccine of 40,000 people. And now you're doing 2400 and you're saying that's enough. So we could have done 24,000 and that way it wouldn't have been 18 children in the placebo group. It would have been 180. I mean, how many children had to get COVID before you were comfortable that the vaccine worked? And that's always the tension. I mean, that is always the tension at these FDA advisory committees meetings. It's, it's never when do you know everything. It's when do you think you know enough knowing that there has never been a medical innovation that is not associated with some level of tragedy. And so what happened with the polio vaccine is two companies made the vaccine for that trial, two veteran vaccine makers, Eli Lilly and Park Davis. But when it was licensed, and at that time it took two and a half hours to get a license, it takes a little longer to get a license today, about uh, 10, 10 months. Now that's not true of the, the COVID vaccines. The COVID vaccines are not, not licensed products. They're, they're uh, approved under emergency use authorization. But uh, that was typically, now it's 10 months to get a typical uh, vaccine license. That took place in two and a half hours. Now there were three other companies that made, made it. And, and, and one of those companies was Cutter Laboratories of Berkeley, California that made the vaccine badly. 
What they did was they failed to fully inactivate the polio virus that was in, in, their, in their vaccine. As a consequence, 120,000 children were inadvertently inoculated with live, fully virulent polio virus. Of those 120,000, 40,000 children in this country got abortive polio from the polio vaccine, meaning got short-lived paralysis. 164 children were permanently paralyzed by that vaccine and, and, and um, 10 children died. I think it really was the worst biological disaster in this country's history, and it led to the birth of vaccine regulation. At the time, there were only 10 people basically at the National Institutes of Health that were supervising vaccines, and it was something they did on the side. Their major interest was doing research. Other than that, um, now, you know, where there's, there's hundreds of people that supervise uh, vaccines, but it was the birth of vaccine regulation. Okay, so, so sort of pulling it to, to the modern day, um, there, were, there was a price to pay here too. I, I think that no one would have ever imagined that mRNA vaccines would cause myocarditis in young boys but, and, and, and young men, meaning sort of basically the 16 to 25 year old, the, the instance is highest of myocarditis, meaning inflammation of the heart muscle. Generally it's short-lived, temporary and self-resolving, but not always. And so that was a surprise. We still don't understand the mechanism by which that happens. And then if you look at the vectored virus vaccines, like the adenovirus vaccine that's used by um, Johnson & Johnson or AstraZeneca, those are rare causes of, of um, blood clots, ser including serious blood clots, including fatal blood clots in the brain. Again, nothing that would have ever been anticipated. And I think that, that sort of as, as a nation, um, we need to understand that you always learn as you go. And I, I think that we, we, as I go through sort of other stories in this book, you know, with anesthesia and chemotherapy and, and um, x-rays, et cetera, there's always a tragedy or tragedies associated with that, with acquiring knowledge. And I think if you ask people, um, do you think we're gonna know more about science and medicine a hundred years from now than we know now? I think everybody would say yes, but nonetheless, when it comes to something you're about to inject, inject into your body, people would like to believe that you know everything you do now when that's almost never the case, especially with a new medical innovation. So I guess I'll just close there and say that um, medical knowledge invariably comes with a human price and there is just no getting around it. We have just not gotten so sophisticated medically or scientifically that we can say that we are now past the learning curve. There's always a learning curve. So thanks for your attention and I will take whatever questions you have. Paul, well, thank you so much for that. You know, <clears throat> I, I don't know, maybe we all, I shouldn't say all, maybe many people will just have this, I don't know, deference to authority. You know, you go in and you think the, the person in the white coat, especially when you're sick, especially when you're vulnerable, has all the answers and they're all the right answers. And you're going to be just magically um, uh, fixed like that. Like one of the, I, I think the stories in the book, um, talked about dentistry and there really was a time when like they, <laughs> there was no anesthesia for this I mean it's bad enough with the anesthesia it's like ah oh, ah oh, that Novocaine shot hurts to go gentle but there there was a time when they that that wasn't a thing um and 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 it now is a a regular thing sometimes covered by insurance sometimes not um but there you there was a lot in here that the the history of the FDA is built on tombstones and there are a lot of mistakes um, in the process, because we're still human beings. Um, I, I saw one of your interviews about this, and you you likened it to um, those of us who are Star Trek fans, who are sort of used to the doctor walking in with the medical tricorder. He waves it. He waves it around, or she, Doctor Beverly, waves it around, figures out exactly what's wrong with you. Boom, there's a treatment. And not to TV fi our lives, but we that's what we want. That's what we're expecting. We don't think there are going to be. Uh, uh, mistakes in the process or that that we're going to be somewhere on that learning curve um, but you're again there thank you for the stories that you share there's so many more um, in the book you guys I really you know it, <laughs> who needs Stephen King when you have all off it oh my gosh um, but I do want to get to these questions thank you everybody you have jumped into this Q&A enthusiastically and that's what we are here for um Robert Wetter I'm, if I'm uh, pronouncing this correctly. And this type of question always comes up, uh, but I'm gonna throw it out to you anyway. Uh, he wants to know, why does my intelligent brother-in-law come up with the idea that vaccines contain graphene oxide? 
how best to debunk this mistaken notion? Yeah, and, and I've heard that a lot. It, it's utter nonsense. I, and I'm not sure where, although I think I, I thought I heard, frankly, of all the anti-vaccine tropes and have been able to find their origin. I could never find the origin of that. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's just completely made up. I think the way that the anti-vaccine people work is they just keep throwing stuff on the wall and hope things stick and things always stick. So this is, um, this is a big one. The one that actually is the most common though is, is the notion that the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, which is what your body makes when you're injected with an mRNA vaccine or a vector virus vaccine, that that protein is toxic. And, and then the, and the, the origin of that is a guy named Dr. Robert Malone. And just, I'm just going to tell you his story because I think he is the single most fascinating anti-vaccine activist out there. So okay. he, he puts this out there that, it, that it's toxic. And what's interesting is that SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, when it's on the virus, actually is tough. I mean, but, but, the, but what you make as a vaccine is, is sort of is, uh, stabilized into pre-fusion state. So it can never fuse with the cell. Therefore, it can never enter the cell. So therefore, it can never do harm that the, spike, the natural spike protein can do. And so he's out there saying, you know, the spike protein is toxic. And, 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 and he claims that he's the inventor of mRNA technology. So here's a guy who says, I'm the inventor of mRNA technology. I should win the Nobel Prize. And yet he damns vaccines. So if you look carefully at his history, I mean, here's a guy who's, who's trained as a biochemist in the University of California system. He's trained as a physician at Northwestern. And if you look at his early publication, he is arguably the inventor of mRNA technology. He was the first to take RNA put it in a, in a lipid droplet and show that it could enter a cell and then be converted into a protein. So he argued, I'm not sure how the Nobel Prize Committee is going to sort this out, should they ever give a Nobel Prize for mRNA technology, but he is arguably the, one of the inventors of mRNA technology and he's out there damning it. And I think the reason he does that, and I could be wrong, but I think the reason that he does that is he thinks he's angry that history has sort of passed him by. Because when you look at all the people they're talking about as the inventors, it's people like like uh, um, mm. like uh, Caitlin Carrico and Drew Weissman at Pet Pan and in Germany, and then Barney Graham and Kizzy Corbett at the National Institutes of Health. You never hear his name, but if you look carefully, he has an argument that he actually is the mm. inventor of mRNA technology, and he's probably the most powerful activist against it because when he says he's the inventor, you know, people take him seriously. Wow, it seems like I'm. I'm absolutely positive of oversimplifying this. This sounds like something that could have been fixed with a better publicist. <laughs> right. Just putting it out there. Um, <clears throat> Gary uh, Betchan, if I'm saying that correctly, um, says many countries in the world have uh, abundant COVID testing opportunities. USA is still uh, waiting in long lines for days later results. Is it true the CDC locked down any testing that kept them out of the reporting loop? And there are uh, killed many, many people and prolonged the epidemic? A lot of questions in the one. So why, why are we lagging here, I guess, is really- No, it, it's, um, it's um, embarrassing. I mean, we, if you look, for example, when the, when the virus first started sweeping across Asia, Europe, the United States, South Korea had testing in place. They did it frequently and often were able to identify where hotspots were and isolate and quarantine people far quicker than we did. The CDC actually, there were a lot of mistakes made initially. And I think the, the biggest was, was not allowing many companies to develop a test instead of doing what we did, which was basically just allow the CDC to be the only one that did that. And they had a problem with their negative control. The negative control mm. when they first sent out their batch <clears throat> of tests was, was occasionally positive. So that was messed up. We've eventually figured this out. I would argue way too late. I mean, I think that, that I mean, this is gonna sound weird to you, but I, I think, I think we're not going to boost our way out of this pandemic. I don't think we're going to mask our way out of this pandemic. And I don't think we're going to test our way out of this pandemic. I think the only way we're going to really get out of this pandemic is to vaccinate our way out of this pandemic. And until we figure out a way to get that roughly 60 to 65 million people in this country who are saying they don't want to get a vaccine to get vaccinated, we are going to be living with this virus. I mean, I think, and, and I could be wrong, but I think that when we, that, that first of all, people who've gotten say two doses of an mRNA vaccine 
are protected against serious illness. I think you can argue that there are those over 65, those who live in long-term care facilities, those who are over 50 with multiple comorbidities, they benefit from, from a third dose, as is shown actually in three papers that are gonna be coming out tomorrow that are embargoed till tomorrow at 11 a.m. But you're gonna be hearing about these three studies tomorrow. And I think okay. that's true. I, but but I, don't, I don't understand the notion of boosting healthy young people. So we're always sort of into further protecting people who are largely protected. I think people who, who tend to mask, I think, are probably more likely to be vaccinated than people who, who, who are unvaccinated. Um, I, similarly, I think people who test care about their health, they care about their neighbor's health, so they're probably more likely to be vaccinated. It's that, that roughly 60 to 65 million people that we have got to figure out a way to do this. So I'm, I, Zeke Emanuel, who's a name you may know, but he sat down with Tony Fauci last night and they've decided they want to kind, kind of come up with a concrete plan that they want to, when I'm, I'm supposed to be part of this, I'm supposed to write this like 15 page document by Monday, which I'm not going to do, but in any case, I'm supposed <laughs> to be doing this. And, and you know, all about how we're, we're going to sort of handle the next year or two, three, 10 regarding this, this variant. And it's just, to me, it's, it's, we have to think of a better way to vaccinate the unvaccinated because mandates only take you so far. And we have, I'll just give you an yeah. example of how I think, how I think you could do it. There's, there's a physician in Philadelphia whose name is Dr. Ayla Stanford. She is, um, she works at Temple. She's she's a pediatric surgeon. She actually was the first pediatric surgeon, first African American pediatric surgeon to be fully trained in the United States. She's amazing. So what does she do? She forms something called the the Black COVID Consortium, where she brings two hundred other doctors into North Philadelphia, West Philadelphia, and gets thousands and thousands of people to be vaccinated. That's the way to do it. it has to happen on the ground. It has to happen with people you trust. This is not going to be a federal or state way of getting past this. And so that has to happen, this grassroots thing to get us vaccinated. But until that happens, we're going to be living with this virus. We're going to be living with this virus for years, if not decades. Uh, that but was we'll, painful. We'll get to the point where we can live with it. I think, I think, you know, I think the difference between pandemic and, and endemic is, is the degree to which it disrupts society. I think we will have what people are calling the new normal, which is what we have with flu. I mean, you know, the year, okay. two years before the, this pandemic started, 700,000 people were hospitalized in this country with flu and 60,000 died. The year before it was 400,000, 20,000, 400,000 hospitalized, 20,000 died. We grandfather that in. That doesn't change our lives. Even though I think if we masked and, and social distance, it probably would, <laughs> we would do better with flu, but we grandfathered it. We will eventually grandfather this virus in at a certain level of hospitalization death. I don't know what that level is, but we will. Wow, okay. Thank you for bringing that dose of reality. No pun intended or pun intended. I don't know. Um, Jimmy Da uh, asks, has there been an increase in the number of false positive HIV results among blood donors uh, uh, months after getting the COVID vaccine? Have you heard that? I, I haven't heard that. No. Okay. No, I hadn't right. heard that. There, there was a vaccine that was made... Um, that was using actually one of the HIV proteins, uh, but but that vaccine never made it to to the final stages. It was not a brilliant idea for that reason that you would then right. test positive for HIV. But the the uh, that never made it. Okay, um, Kathy um, Moyd uh, said uh, I was one of the first to get the Salk vaccine in school in Yonkers, New York. Yay, New York! Uh, is it possible that I got a placebo? Well, if you were part of the trial, you would have known it. Um, okay. it, it was the Francis Field trial. You got you got a vaccine. You got the vaccine or placebo. You got a little yellow pin that said Polio Pioneer. You got a lollipop. Um, but if you, I mean, I was born in 1951, so I, I also got the soft vaccine. But I got the vaccine. I got it in 1956 when I was five years old. So so by then the vaccine was a licensed product. So it, mm -hmm. it depends on what year you got it. If you got it after 1955, you you didn't get placebo. Okay. I, uh, I, I, this is wild to me. This is absolutely wild to me because by the time I came along, it's like polio was just a word. <laughs> it meant Gen X was like, yeah, whatever. We're just going to play our music loud. Um, James said, what about the effect on unborn babies? Kind of like thalidomide babies. Is that a thing? And I know you've talked about this before about the vaccine not being uh, and uh, having an effect uh, on, on onboard babies and, and that women should have been, pregnant women should have been included in the trial. Is that correct? You have a good memory. That's exactly right. I, mean, I, think, I think that when, um, when the phase three trials were done, 
they didn't include pregnant women. They should have, because if you're, mm -hmm. if you're pregnant um, and you get SARS-CoV-2 and you get COVID, you have a two and a half to three times greater risk of being hospitalized, having to go to the ICU, being mechanically mm -hmm. ventilated than if you are a woman of the same age who's not pregnant. So when the vaccine came out, uh, usually what the CDC will do when, when pregnant women aren't studied is they'll say it's contraindicated because there's no data. They didn't do that here for this the reason they said a pregnant woman could reasonably choose to get the vaccine it wasn't a recommendation it was a you could do it if you want and so tens of thousands of pregnant women made that choice wisely um then that, now you had information now you could compare women who were pregnant who got the vaccine to women who were pregnant who didn't get the vaccine to see whether there was any difference in the pregnancy outcome any difference in the neonatal outcome and, and there wasn't and with that the cdc then said is recommended What's happened in the last few weeks, actually, is because there's been an increase in pregnant women who have been hospitalized in the ICU, mechanically ventilated, deliver babies prematurely, is they've actually increased that recommendation to urgently recommend it that pregnant women be vaccinated. Mm, okay. Uh, where did this question go? Okay, Erica Klein had a good question regarding the, the teen COVID vaccine trial on 2,400 uh, kids. And when is the number high enough? Aren't there statistical tests to answer that question? And it's not just a gut decision. Well, the, the, so, so you know that in, say, the 12 to 15 year old, there's 2,400 child study. There were 1,200 got vaccine, 1,200 got placebo, 18, got, um, 18 of those in the placebo group got sick. So you, you can say with a certain level of confidence that you had, you know, 100% Popul 100% of the population was protected. Obviously, um, the, the larger the number, the more, the, the sort of the tighter the confidence intervals. And, and so how tight do you want them to be? It's interesting that when, with the vac before the vaccine came out, we were told, we, the FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee, was told that we could reasonably approve a vaccine that was 50% effective with a, a lower bound of confidence interval of 30%. And, and that Dr. Fauci, I remember at the time, said that he thought that the vaccine could be as, as much as 70% effective. Well, it was 95% effective, um, at least in the short term. Because remember, when we, did, when we looked at those studies, those were three-month studies. I mean, those, those yeah. people had just gotten a second dose. And that's why mm -hmm. when we saw 95% efficacy against mild disease, there's no way that was going to last. Um, because mild, protection against mild illness is mediated by neutralizing antibodies. The people in that phase three trial had just recently gotten a second dose. So they had high levels of neutralizing antibodies, which will always fade and faded here. And so you saw consistent protection against serious illness. That's good. But you saw a decrease in protection against mild disease. The biggest communications error that we made with this vaccine was ever la labeling mild disease a breakthrough. That's not a breakthrough. That's what you want. You want to be protected against severe disease, which this vaccine does. It is way too high of a bar to expect this kind of vaccine, meaning a vaccine to prevent a mucosal virus from protecting against mild disease. That's just not reasonable, unless you're, you want to get a booster dose every three months, which is, that's why I was, I was as was every other, virtually every other member of FDA's Vaccine Advisory Committee was against the booster dose for healthy young people. It, there was no data for that. I think, think there's still no data for that. And they're going to try and sell these data tomorrow after 11 a.m. that they have data okay. for that, but they don't. They only have it for older people or people who have comorbidities. So don't let them sell it that way. I still don't like it when, when colleges or universities or hospitals or med schools require a third dose for healthy young people. I don't see any evidence for that. And it just upsets me, unless you want to get a booster dose every three months, in which case you can get one of those little Pfizer loyalty cards, one of those little punch cards, that <laughs> after you eight dose, you get a free pizza. And maybe you can do that one. Ooh, free pizza. Okay, I'm in, but I'm probably not in the group that needs to be convinced. I'm going to ask, what? how are we defining young here? What, what, what I would is, say is, anybody, anybody, uh, well, I would say young is less than 65. However, if you're over okay. 50 and you have comorbidities, you know, obesity or chronic heart disease, chronic lung disease, et cetera, especially more than one comorbidity, then I would okay. say that's true. So, so then may, maybe I'm defining young as less than 50. Okay, so so once again, illness ages you. So all right, but under sixty five, whew, I made it. Thank you so much, <laughs> dear diary. I'm still young. Um, Bill Gowan, um, did we talk? Did I do this one? I didn't. Okay, said a small percentage of COVID vaccine recipients had the myocardial uh, reaction, mostly young men. Um, how should those who were affected proceed with boosters as time goes on? 
Um, like he says, I know of one who was advised by his cardiologist not to get this round of booster. I agree. I think if you've had a, a if you've had, nobody really understands it. It's not, okay. I wish we had a different word than myocarditis. Myocarditis means inflammation of the heart muscle. There, there are viruses that do that, a vi like Coxsackie virus can infect your heart muscle. And that is a serious disease. I mean, that usually okay. not only means a hospital admission, it invariably means an ICU admission. And 9% of the time, it means a heart transplant. I mean, that's myocarditis, that's viral myocarditis. This is not quite that. It's immune okay. mediated, I meaning the virus, there isn't, you're not infected with the virus, you're given mRNA that makes one protein. You're making this, this aberrant immune response that causes you to have a short-lived temporary transient myocarditis that doesn't appear to have long-term sequelae, at least as far as we know. So, but I agree with that. I think you're gonna, invariably there's a spectrum of illness. I think we're gonna find out things we prefer not to find out soon enough that there may be more long-term problems with hearts uh, it, it, who had that. And I think that if you've gotten say, it, cause it's invariably a second dose phenomenon. And it's usually within hmm. four, days, four days of the second dose is invariably boys or young men. And so there is no reason to get a, a third dose there. You're good. So okay. I agree, I agree with that cardiologist. Okay, awesome. Uh, Peter wants to know, do you think uh, that in general, the medical field explains risk, risks well to patients? I think that's kind of broad. Some do, some don't. Yeah, no, I but think it's hard to explain relative risk. I, I, I think okay. um, because we have trouble dis dis distinguishing relative risk from attributable risk. You know, I think, um, how can I say this? So, so if I'm standing in front of my house, assuming I had a lawn, which I don't, so I live in the city, but let's assume I was standing in front of my, my lawn in the city here, here, or sitting, sitting on my lawn in front of the house, I have a certain risk of being hit by a car. Um, if I cross the street, I have a greater risk. So the relative risk of being hit, be, being hit by a car if I cross the street as compared to just stand in, on my lawn is, is much greater. But I cross the street all the time and never get hit. So, so the, the attributable risk is much, much, much less lower than the relative risk. So I think you're right. We, we don't explain it. Well, I think what people hear, I mean, so for example, your chance of, of, of having, say, a severe blood clot from that Johnson & Johnson vaccine when it was first released was roughly one per 500,000. You're approaching the risk of being hit by lightning, which is roughly one in 770,000. Now it's come down to about one in 200,000. But imagine that you are in in the stadium, the big house at the University of Michigan, which seats 100,000 people. So imagine two of those stadiums, and you would be one person in, in, in those two stadiums that that could happen to. But I, I think when mm. people hear that there's a problem, they think that, you know, that, that, that's, the, that that's a real risk. And we, we tend to, to rate things that we do to ourselves as, as, as a worse risk. Than, than if we don't do something. So in other words, you, you will, it's sort of like the sin of omission versus the sin of commission. If you do something, if I give myself a vaccine or give my child a vaccine and there's a negative effect, that's much worse, root is, feud is worse than if I don't do anything and my child happens to get COVID. But remember huh. COVID or SARS-CoV-2, SARS the virus also causes myocarditis at a much greater rate than does the vaccine. So if you believe mm. that the virus is common, then you know, you're at risk. It's interesting. The, um, the, the New York state sell, sells its lottery tickets where you have basically a 14 million to one chance of getting, getting uh, get, of winning with the simple phrase, it could happen to you. And I think that's, mm. that's the problem with relative risk. I would argue the biggest risk of getting vaccines is driving to the office to get them. <laughs> or here in New York trying to get an appointment. What? It's insane. Okay. You know what? And this is, this is coming down to some of the other talks we've had. You know, we, we're not good at math here in America, you know, because yeah, you, the way you just explained that makes complete and total sense. None of my teachers ever did that. Um, Joan wants to know, do we measure antibody levels for other vaccines or just COVID? First of all, I don't even think we should be doing it for COVID. I mean, we should do it for the trials. I mean, look at the okay. levels, but certainly we do phase one, phase two, phase three studies. We need to know those data. The, the, the problem with looking at neutralizing antibodies is it's only one component of the immune system. The most important component of your immune system in terms of protection against serious illness are really memory cells, memory B cells, or B cells are the kind of cells that make antibodies. Memory T helper cells, which are the kind of cells that help B cells make antibodies. Memory cytotoxic T cells, which are the kind of cells that kill virus infected cells. Those are not commercially available tests. Those are research tools. So you're really not measuring necessarily the right thing. There are people who have relatively low antibodies by neutralizing antibody levels that are still protected because you just want to be protected against serious illness, which is mediated by memory cells, which are long lived. 
So that's the good news about coronavirus. I was just on this, this conference call with about 30 people that are supposed to be writing this thing for, for the Trump, for the Trump administration, for the Biden administration. And um, you know, that's the message that I think we need to get through here is that you are protected against serious disease. This is not flu. I don't think we're gonna need a yearly, yearly vaccine here as we do for flu. I think that I think protection against serious illness is going to be years. We'll see. I'm, I'm, maybe I'm wrong, but we'll see. Hmm. OK, well, see, now I'm a little bit confused. Uh, you don't think this, this will be like the flu, even if is that with if we get all these other people vaccinated or if we don't? Get no, so, so I think see, you, you get a flu vaccine every year because flu, flu vaccine, flu virus mutates so much from one year to the next that even mm -hmm. natural infection or immunization the year for, before does not protect you against serious illness. That's okay. not true with coronavirus. Although corona, coronavirus clearly does mutate, it doesn't mutate nearly to the extent that flu does, although you would never know that from reading, that, from reading or watching television, but it doesn't mutate right. nearly as much as flu. So, so I think what, what you, I would expect, it, think about it, take, take a step back for a second. The, the vaccines were made against the original strain, the so-called right. WU2020 strain, the strain that, that, that was originally isolated in Wuhan. That's not the virus that left China. And the virus that left China was the so-called D614G strain, never had a Greek letter designation. That's the one that swept across you know, Asia, Europe, the US. It was replaced by the alpha strain, it was replaced by the delta strain, it was replaced by the Omicron strain. In all cases, vaccines protect against serious illness from all four of those variants, even though it wasn't made to protect against any of them. It was made to protect against the original Wuhan strain, which shows you that those, those immunological reasons are conserved across all those four variants. Now, there may be a variant that, that comes up that is resistant to protection against severe disease. And when you, then if that happens, then you need another vaccine. But I really don't like it when the pharmaceutical companies are saying, you know, well, you know, now we can make an Omicron specific vaccine. Or they say, you know, we're doing studies now where, we're, where you can give the, the, the coronavirus vaccine at the same time you're giving the influenza vaccine. It's like, I just, these pharmaceutical companies are acting like public health agencies. All that information mm. should be coming from the CDC, not from, from Albert Borla. I, I mean, it's just, uh, Albert Borla is not Rochelle Walensky. It's Rochelle Walensky should be telling you, you know, what it is we need to get, when we need to get it. Okay. She's um, ahead of I, I, I think I can almost imagine your answer to this question, but I'm going to throw it out there anyway. Uh, C. Kavanaugh says, do you foresee a time in the future where there will not be a human cost, or at least it will be limited? Will computer models exist in the future that can be used instead of humans in the trial stages? No. <laughs> I, just, I, I just, knew it! <laughs> I, just have, I, think, I think the, the I guess, to me, this when the, when the writing of this book and in my experience, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be part of a team at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia that invented a vaccine, the rotavirus vaccine. I mean, I think in, in all this, you have to learn an enormous amount of humility. I mean, nature gives up its secrets slowly, grudgingly, and invariably with the human cost. And we always think we can get, get ahead of that, but yeah. we just never have. And I, so I'm choosing to believe that at least it, it's not going to happen. I, I can't see it happening. I can't. So I just think I, we, too, too much to learn. Yeah, I, I got I was in Italy a few years ago and I got a chance to go to the uh, the Museum of Science. And uh, suffice it to say, I was incredibly overwhelmed because the successes, the things that work are out in the world. We're using them. We're doing it. We take it. We take it for granted. And the museum was filled with all the other things, all the other scientists, all the other in inventions that missed that weren't quite right, or they just move the needle a little bit. And all you forget all of those steps, how long advancements actually take all that trial and error. Uh, that's that's necessary for us to take indoor plumbing for granted to take this this technology that we're doing right here to come together to take it for granted. This wasn't always here. And there are a lot of steps, uh, both in in technology and in, in medicine that it. Yeah, room for error. Yeah, I mean, uh, the unfortunately, the technology is not new. I mean, people have been working on the, this kind of technology for almost 20 years. The vectored virus vaccines technology is not new. It used for the Ebola vaccine in West Africa. So they, these weren't new in that sense. Nonetheless, mm -hmm. it was a complete surprise. The myocarditis, right. the, the blood clots in the brain, where it was a complete surprise. 
And I just think that's always true. And that's why when they were, do, when, when they were doing phase one studies, the say Pfizer and Moderna, you know, the CEO said, now we can make millions of doses after they tested it in like 25 people. It's like, you know, please don't say this. I mean, be humble, if nothing else, you should learn that, that we, we have to be humble in this game. Yeah, humans, some humans aren't good at humble. Um, Carrie Poppy, thank you for this. Uh, she said, your wonderful presentation is reminding me of some research sponsored by uh, Women Thinking Free and the James Randi Educational Foundation that found that it, de it decreases vaccine hesitancy to talk about the actual real downsides to vaccine because then the vaccine skeptic sees that you're taking them seriously. Is that the aim of your book? Yes, I mean, I, th I think yes, in, in part. Yes, I, I think why I'm trying to give people sort of a realistic sense of, 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 of science and vaccines. The, the book before this was called Overkill When Modern Medicine Goes mm -hmm. Too Far, which cost them sort of all those times where there's clear scientific evidence that we shouldn't be doing something in medicine, but we do it anyway, like treating fever, for example. But you know, which can increase your risk actually of of having more prolonged or serious infections. I mean, there's probably 20 studies that have shown that, and I, I think that's true here too. By the way, if if you have SARS-CoV-2 infection, try not to treat your fever because you make fever because your immune system works better at a higher temperature. That's why you're willing to pay a metabolic price for that higher temperature. So th that oh. was just many sort of in that book overkill, but. No, I always try and do that. I mean, Pandora's Lab was, was another book I wrote called, the subtitle of which was Seven Stories of Science Gone Wrong, which are those scientific advances that, that weren't advances, but did much to harm us. I, I think I, I do agree with you, and that's a very good way of putting it, that, that to be honest about all our mistakes and how we, we're trying to learn. And I, I think that does help to some extent. But I do think there are some people, at least, and they certainly have my email address, who you know who are... Uh, just conspiracy theorist, and they think you're part of a conspiracy and you are never going to convince them, right? That's the Neil deGrasse Tyson line. If somebody doesn't use reason or logic to reach a conclusion, reason or logic is never gonna talk them out of it, so. Mm. This is, I guess, sort of uh, it pairs nicely, uh, like a wine, perhaps. Um, Matthew Havisto's question or, or statement here, um, anti-vaxxers are, are fond of pointing out only the failures and tragedies, uh, but the percentages, especially today, are still in favor of being vaxxed, yes? Oh yeah, I, you know, if you'd asked me a, f a couple of years ago um, that, and said there's gonna be a pandemic, it's going to kill <laughs> 900,000 people in the United States. It's going to kill you know, millions and millions of people worldwide. Within, within 11 months of its appearance, you're gonna have a vaccine that is highly effective and remarkably safe. Do I think, do you think the anti-vaccine movement will suffer that? Because now you have your ticket out of the pandemic, the vaccine. So they look all the worse in that case. And I would have said, yes, I think they would have suffered that, but I was wrong. If anything, they're, they're flying these days. I mean, they're more effective than ever at getting bad information out there. I mean, you have tens of millions of people in this country who are choosing not to be vaccinated. I, I can't begin to tell you how frustrating this is. I mean, when we, I was on service a couple weeks ago, we admitted 18 kids to the hospital when I was on service. I mean, all but one were over five. I mean, this was after November 2nd when we had vaccines available for the greater than five-year-old and not one mm -hmm. of those children was vaccinated. Not one of their parents were vaccinated. Not one of the siblings were vaccinated. But the only one, there was one father who was vaccinated, even though the mother wasn't, the siblings weren't, and the child wasn't. And when I asked him why he was vaccinated, he said, because he had to be vaccinated for work. So I do think mandates do have some effect, but um, it's just so frustrating. This was frustrating enough before we had a vaccine. Now you have a vaccine, you watch these children suffer, you watch them get, get sort of sedated, brought up to the intensive care unit, you watch a tube getting put down their trachea, you watch the parents crying while you're attaching them to the ventilator and you're thinking, all of this could have been prevented if you just got a vaccine. Or you watch Kyrie Irving, right? Who's unwilling to, to, to be vaccinated so he can't play at home for the Brooklyn Nets, for which he's willing to lose $17 million. I mean, there are people out there who would get a heart transplant for $17 million. He's just being asked to get a couple shots. Oof, yeah. Uh, I, have, I want to get in. We still have a few minutes. I want to get in several more questions here if I can. And everybody, thank you so much for the, the amount of questions and the quality of your questions. Um, Tim Moore says that I am always astonished that it seems that most drugs are given with a fixed dose, not dependent on the weight of the recipient. Is that the case? And is there no uh, problem giving the same dose to people from, say, 120 pounds to 300 pounds? 
Right, so when you get drugs, an antibiotic, for example, um, you need to have a certain level of that antibiotic in your bloodstream, say per milliliter of blood, in order to be effective. So weight matters, size matters. Okay. That's really... Not really to the adult and to the child is of the of the of the vaccines for the process of the, 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 the a baby get or child gets D D T A P vaccine so they actually get a more tetanus more tetanus and diphtheria components so whereas the adult gets big T little D A P so the adult gets actually less pertussis and less uh, diphtheria component so but so it really size doesn't it, it's not size that matters here it, it's it's not it just doesn't Thank relate you. to vaccines so it's not it's not sort of bloodborne. Okay, thank you for that. Um, L. David Wise, great last name, um, but but does that knowledge of the downside to all vaccine and medical advancements warrant the decision to not get the COVID nineteen vaccine? Yeah, it's so it's always a matter of relative risk. I mean, there's no risk free choices. The, the, your goal is a, as a okay. as, as trying to take care of yourself or trying to take care of your child. Is take the lesser risk. I mean. The, the, a choice not to get a vaccine is not a risk-free choice. This is a common virus, especially Omicron, I mean, which has really, really taken over in, in this country. I mean, it's a doubling time of like two days. It's taken over in this country. You're, you know, it's, you know, I, I forget, I was just on a conference call where they talked about the percentage of people in the United States have already been exposed to this virus. It was, you know, it's like 60% of people in this country have already been exposed to this virus. It's that common. So a choice not to get a vaccine is not a risk-free choice. And, and, Although Omicron is less virulent, it's not a virulent. I mean, you, you know, it's not it's not like an attenuated virus. And you you know, virologists, the term they use for circulating virus is the wild type virus. That's the term they use because it's out of control. So I, I was actually a little disappointed when uh, Tony Fauci the other day said, you know, this may have been the live uh, sort of uh, 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 live vaccine, live viral vaccine we've all wanted. No, 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 no. It, it, you don't want to risk this. I mean, we certainly see people coming into our hospital and the hospital next door, the adult hospital, that are seriously affected by this virus. So, so you never want that. So the, the goal of a vaccine is to induce the immunity that's a consequence of natural infection without paying the price of natural infection. There was an mRNA question here. Oh, here it is. Uh, John Shepard uh, wants to know, is mRNA technology as great a breakthrough as it appears to be? We'll see. It, it certainly worked for this pathogen. I mean, people are now doing um, studies to see whether or not it could be valuable for HIV, an HIV vaccine, for a malaria vaccine, for a better tuberculosis vaccine, for a universal flu vaccine, which we've been working on for like 50 years. Um, we'll see whether that it, it translates or maybe it may just be unique to this particular germ. We'll, we'll see. We'll see. But certainly I will say this, though. It is a remarkable product. I do think that in, it's, the, it's the greatest medical advance in my lifetime, a lifetime that includes the development of the polio vaccine. Because what, what's amazing about this vaccine is we give a lot of shots to children. Um, and what we don't see, with the exception of, say, the smallpox vaccine, because I'm old enough to remember that, is sort of the degree of swelling of the lymph node under the arm. I mean, this is a powerful image. And that's why only two doses, given three weeks or four weeks apart, has been able to provide at least a year's worth of protection against serious illness. It's remarkable. We'll see to what extent it, it affects uh, other, other pathogens. All right. Uh, I think you know this person. Uh, Tim Huston says, Paul, I miss our discussions on the bus on the way to work. <laughs> uh, the other side of the coin is the remarkable discoveries that are made in pharmaceutical research while looking for something completely different. Uh, do you have any uh, stories regarding that? Uh, he would like, I'm guessing he's asking because you do. Well, the, yeah, the, the, um, the chemotherapy story that I tell in this uh, book is, um, is, is Sidney Farber, who's probably the most famous of the sort of cancer chemotherapists. It's, it's the, the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. He's the Farber of, of Dana-Farber. And um, okay. you know, what he did initially was he, he gave, um, it, it was sort of, we learned from, our, again, sort of you learn from your mistakes, but what he did was he gave a folic acid agonist to like 11 children with leukemia at a time when leukemia was a death sentence where nobody got past a year when they were diagnosed with leukemia. And he actually mm -hmm. made it worse. 
He actually caused those children to die within a few months as compared to within a year. And, and with that, he realized this, he was doing the opposite of what he should have been doing. So instead of giving a folic acid agonist, which only promoted growth, is to give a folic acid antagonist, which, which became essentially aminopterin, which became a methotrexate, which is still used. Um, but that was, that was this. And the first person, interestingly, the first person to get that chemotherapy, to get a folic acid antagonist, was a guy who used to play for the New York Yankees. He had the number three on his back. He had a severe <laughs> cancer, and his name was Babe Ruth. I love it. That, that's a baseball guy? Not football? That's a Wait, baseball guy. <laughs> Babe Ruth was a baseball guy. My father would be horrified that I just said that. Oh, goodness. Thank you uh, for that answer. Um, I, 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 there's so many more questions here, but we are, we are right at the hour. Um, I see a lot of friends in here uh, who, uh, who have signed on. Margaret Downey, I see you. I see your hubby, too. Um, yeah, yeah. Paul Waves. This, you know, is, this is fantastic. Hi, Margaret. But I, How are you doing? Well, you know what? She actually said that she's kind of glad she, uh, of course, I like me, didn't live at a time uh, without anesthesia. Um, it's needed. Is there a danger to using it for a surgical procedure within a certain amount of time? Is it? Yeah, no, no, so, so sort of anything that, that the, anesthesia does have a risk. It's really rare. It's like one in 10,000 for people who are otherwise healthy that can die from anesthesia. But the, the, my favorite line it was either Gore Vidal or Norman Mailer, who, who had written a book like about Lincoln and you know, Burr. Um, and he was asked the question, you know, um, wouldn't you have liked to have lived at that time? And he said, I would never want to live at a time that hadn't perfected anesthesia. Or bourbon. I'm sorry, that's a very bourbon, different thing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> or cable. So I could go rewatch Ted Lasso, courtesy of you, and Yellowstone. And now, since you've mentioned it, Paul, thank you. Listen, I know you're incredibly busy and incredibly tired. And I really appreciate uh, you that the third time's the charm for you coming back here and you you sharing your your time and your expertise with us. And I, I just want to remind everybody in the audience, especially if you're new here, um, if you missed anything, uh, the recording of this uh, event will be available tomorrow at skepticalenquirer.org. And I give my special thanks uh, to Skeptical Inquirer, to CFI, our producer in the background, the amazing Mark Kreidler. Thank you so much for making all this tech magic work for us. And especially to you, the audience. Uh, my name is Leanne Lord, a uh, new CFI fellow. Uh, thank you so much and good night. Paul, again, thanks a lot. Have a wonderful night. Thank you. You too. Stay safe.